Welcome to the Osmosis Daily Report on the Coronavirus Pandemic. I'm Dr. Risha Desai. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Osmosis. I'm also a Pediatric Infectious Disease Doctor, and I used to work at the CDC in the Division of Viral Diseases doing viral outbreak research. Today I wanted to talk about managing L-type COVID-19 patients. To get us started, I wanted to take a look at this report. It's from the ICN ARC. It aggregates data on COVID-19 patients that were critically ill, and it looks at a few areas, uh, geographically, specifically England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And there's a, a specific uh, thing that hopped out at me. It's right here in Table 5, and it's outcome at the end of critical care. And pretty obvious, either you're alive or you're dead. And they looked at 1,689 folks with COVID-19 and compared them to 5,367 people without COVID-19, maybe with other viral pneumonias, to see how the outcomes uh, differed. And if you'd asked me a few, a few months ago, I would have said, well, I would presume that the outcomes would be very similar to any other viral pneumonia. But in fact, that's not the case. And if you look at these data, it's actually starkly different. So alive, we have 48%, whereas normally with viral pneumonia that are, that are seriously ill, you get a 78% survival. So to flip that around, 52% of these folks are dying with COVID-19, and normally that number should be much lower, closer to 22%. So let's get into this paper. It's about COVID-19 and the two categories of patients put forth by an author, Gattinoni, who's basically saying, maybe we're thinking about this slightly wrong. Maybe it isn't one pathway that we're seeing with patients with COVID-19. Maybe there are two types of patients and they need to be treated differently. So he puts forth this idea of L patients and H patients. So here's this section on L patients and a couple of key things I just want to flag for us. He says the L patient basically has nearly normal compliance. Their lungs are essentially working nearly normally. And in fact, the, the real problem, he says, may be best explained by a loss of regulation of perfusion. Again, perfusion means blood flow getting to those airways. He's saying that maybe that's the majority of the problem in these L patients is the perfusion, the blood flow. Following that logic, a lot of this other stuff sort of falls into place. He says the lungs are basically working quite well, that, that you know, if you look on a CT scan, you're not seeing uh, a lot of disease. He says only ground glass densities are present. You know, that's not a lot of disease. And he says, and this is kind of a, a funny worded uh, phrase, but he says the amount of non-aerated tissue is low. And in fact, uh, that's what he means by low recruitability, meaning that generally speaking, the airways are pretty uh, well functioning. And so in terms of treatment, a couple of concrete things that you can glean from this. He says, look, these L-type patients, they can actually, because their lungs are fairly well functioning, can tolerate these higher volumes. You don't need to just limit it to six milliliters per kilogram, which is fairly normal. He says you can go up to eight to nine milliliters per kilogram in terms of ventilation. He also says that the PEEP, which is the peak end expiratory pressure, should be reduced to eight to 10 centimeters of water. So again, the problem is not stenting these airways open, the airways are functioning pretty darn well, so you can use the higher volumes, you can use a lower PEEP for ventilating these individuals. And one way to think about these individuals then is that it's almost like they have altitude sickness. And remember in altitude sickness, you've got you know, uh, the blood vessels clamping down everywhere because there's a low oxygen amount in the lungs, and so you have hypoxic vasoconstriction. In this case, it's a similar phenomenon. We don't know why there's a perfusion problem necessarily, and that's still to be figured out. Uh, there's some ideas, but that seems to be the issue. And, you know, unlike altitude sickness where you just bring them down off a mountain, uh, you know, you obviously can't do that with COVID-19 unless you understand why there's a perfusion problem. But again, the, the underlying issue here is with these L patients, he's presuming that they, they're showing a physiology that is more about the perfusion side being a problem, not so much the ventilation side. The flip side is, of course, the H-type patient. The H-type patient is more your classic ARDS picture. They do have high elastins, uh, high lung weight from all that water. You see a lot of disease on CT. And in this situation, you're using kind of a more uh, typical uh, ventilation volume of six milliliters per kilogram, and you're gonna use a higher PEEP to kind of keep the airways open. Again, the H-type patient does have a problem with airways rather than perfusion. And so to help with ventilation, which is their more kind of uh, acute issue, this is a more typical type uh, scenario in terms of how you manage them. There's a, a quick little CT scan image of kind of what they imagine a more L-type uh, 
person to look like in A, and then a more H-type person in B. And you can see the disease is much more significant. And of course, uh, there is the possibility that we're just seeing stages of the disease. Maybe, maybe people start L-type and then become H-type as things get worse. And that's certainly a possibility. So just to kind of show us visually what I'm talking about again, uh, there's this example on the left, pulmonary embolism, where the blockage is a blood clot that is not allowing blood to go past an alveoli full of, full of air, or oxygen in this case. And so you can see that this is a perfusion problem. And again, pulmonary embolism is, is an example of a perfusion problem, but the L-type patient would fit that physiology. Whereas opposed to that, we've got an airway obstruction on the right, and that's where the airway itself is not getting much, much uh, air in, and that's the major problem. And the blood flow clearly is fine in that side, so that's, again, more the H-type physiology. So I just wanted to kind of show these. And again, the, the examples here, pulmonary embolism and airway obstruction, are other things that cause that physiology. But these help to illustrate kind of what might be happening with L versus H. But it is a good segue because one of the ideas is that maybe something about COVID-19 is causing tiny little blood clots. So in a way, maybe it is acting a little bit like a pulmonary embolism uh, in, in, in so far as causing some perfusion problems because of those blood clots. So let's get into that now. There's this paper that talks about the use of low molecular weight heparin to mitigate cytokine storm in severe COVID-19 patients. And, and what we're seeing is that patients do have a lot of cytokine release and there are some downstream effects of those cytokines that may actually explain why some patients have perfusion problems. So this part of the article is actually pretty interesting. It basically says there are studies that talk about COVID-19 patients and that one of those cytokines that they're seeing as part of the cytokine storm is IL-6. And IL-6 levels, when they, when they rise really high in those severely ill COVID-19 patients, it can cause a number of things, including things like coagulation or blood clots, as well as what we call DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation, meaning little blood clots that form essentially inside the blood vessel. So again, thinking back to that picture of pulmonary embolism, you can imagine now that if we're seeing this phenomenon of cytokines being released, that could explain some of the perfusion problems that we're physiologically seeing with the L-type patients. And the key finding that I gleaned from this, which was really interesting, is that essentially with low molecular weight heparin, the levels of IL-6 in the group that got it were significantly lower uh, than the group that didn't get it. So that might be part of the mechanism for why heparin seems to be helpful in this group. Finally, there's this study. It's, it's about anticoagulant treatment, and what they found was decreased mortality in severe coronavirus disease. And so let me just show you how they did it. So a subset of the patients, 99 of the patients, got heparin treatment for about a week, or at least a week, and 94 of those got the low molecular weight heparin, and they give the dose 40 to 60 milligrams of anoxaparin per day. So what they saw is that among the sickest patients, and this is this SIC score, among the sickest patients, though that those that scored above a four on this scale, and you can look up exactly how that scoring works, the folks that got heparin essentially did better, and it was very significant, than the folks that didn't get heparin. So this is interesting because remember, at the beginning of this, I talked about how we're seeing really bad outcomes in people that are very, very severely ill. This suggests that maybe those patients need heparin, and maybe the reason for that is because it's a perfusion problem. Maybe the reason for that is that they are L-type patients that would benefit more from perfusion therapy than ventilation therapy. Now, it is interesting, if you look just right below my line that I highlighted, among less sick patients, they found that actually mortality was higher with heparin. And again, that makes you wonder whether we need to think about treating based on the type of patient. Now, that wasn't a significant finding, but it is kind of brings to light the idea that maybe the sickest patients are the ones we're treating maybe slightly off of what they actually need. So I hope you found that helpful. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, please hit the red subscribe button and the bell icon to get daily updates. And remember to help us by flattening the curve and raising the line. We're all in this together. Thank you.